Greetings in the name of the Lord. You're looking good out there this morning. Jesus is looking good on you. Are you ladies refreshed and blessed? And Yeah. I'm telling you, they had a women's conference here yesterday, and uh, I had other places to be, but the Lord was moving and didn't want to leave. But God is good. Amen? Amen. All the time. What a week we've had around here. I had a community meeting Tuesday evening that uh, kind of went sour and went south, but we made it through it all right. Just a lot of people protesting, you know, putting the development. By the way, the development's not going to be on our property if it does come. It's just going to be to the edge of it out there. A lot of people say, well, how much property are we going to lose? We're not going to lose any property. Amen. Property we have belongs to God. Glory to God. Amen. And it's in his hands. But anyway... And then we had that women's conference yesterday. That was an awesome time. We were, I was here long enough to help lead some worship in it. And uh, got to hear all those beautiful voices that I got to hear on Mother's Day. I got to hear it again yesterday. And I was like, man, we probably need to start a choir soon. Yeah. Got some voices out there. Well, how are you? Doing all right? Hanging in there. Spring is back. We had summer for a little while, but it's back now. All right. Are you ready to receive the Word of God? I started two years ago preaching through the Bible. I started in Genesis. We made it all the way to Numbers just about this time last year. And then God's taken us for a detour, but we can't leave those Israelites hanging in the wilderness, right? We're finally back there again. I've had some people say, man, when are you going to get back to Numbers? Today is the day. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to book of Numbers, chapter 25. We're going to look at the first three verses there. And would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word this morning. Good to see all your smiling faces. Some of you are new. Some of you are our New Life family. have been here forever. Some of you, New Life family, have been gone a while. Now you're back. Good to have you home. Amen. I see a lot of faces out there I haven't seen for a while. All right. We want you to make a habit out of it. Don't make it so long in between visits, all right? But it's good to have you here this morning. In Numbers 23, which is where we left off last time, Balaam, remember, was a man who, King Balak, who was the king of the Moabites, he realized that Israel was already defeating all of their enemies that they had come across in the wilderness. And so Balak decided that he would get a hold of a prophet, Balaam, And he would get him to curse Israel. He realized that he was not going to defeat Israel with horses and chariots and spears and swords. You know, it's wise enough to know that there are powers greater than us in this world. Amen? There really is. And so he sent for Balaam in, in Numbers 25 that we looked at. We saw that instead of cursing Israel, which is what King Balak wanted him to do, he actually blessed Israel. And you need to read chapters 24 and 25 of Balaam's blessing because it is the blessing on God's people. And that blessing never fails. That blessing always stands because God is a covenant-keeping God. There's a lot of good promises to you and I as well in there. The only problem was Balaam eventually sold out anyway. He sold out for a price. He sold out Israel and he sold out God. And as we saw when we looked at this chapter many months ago, Eventually, Balaam himself would lose his own life. But I want to read Numbers 25, verse 1 to you. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women, who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal, and they bowed down before those gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. God would send a plague into Israel, and 24,000 plus would lose their lives in this way. Would you bow your heads with me, please, and let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we just come before you right now, and Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that it is life and health to all of our being, Lord God. Father, you created us with a soul hunger down inside of us and man cannot live by bread alone but needs every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God and father you declared that these things that we read in the old testament of old 
were written not only for them, but for our admonition and our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. And so, Father, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand this morning that we might grow, that we might receive the engrafted word that's able to save our souls. And, Father, to cleanse us, to sanctify us, to renew us, to transform us and regenerate us into the likeness and image of your Son. God, our cry to you this morning is, is that, Father, we would be able to take all that we are, all that we ever hope to be, all that we ever hope for, and lay it at the foot of the cross and say, not our will, but thy will be done, O God. And, Father, I ask that you would touch every one of our hearts and lives this morning. Don't pass this preacher by. Holy Spirit, be our teacher, be our guide. Change us. In Jesus' name is our prayer. And everybody in agreement with that prayer said, Amen. I'm glad you said it, but that's a dangerous prayer. It really is. God, God will honor that prayer. He will change our lives. In Numbers 25, we read this, verse 4, The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of these people, kill them, and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, Each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. I read that to you this morning because if we're not careful, especially in our day and time, we will create a God made in our image, a God that's made in our likeness. We will sissify him and put long hair on him and lily white cheeks. And we will make him a God that we just, you know, he's our granddaddy, grandpapa in the sky, if you will. But we need to always remember that God, even though he is a loving and merciful, he is long-suffering, his mercy is everlasting, he is also holy and righteous and just and true. Amen? God used the nation of Israel to teach us spiritual lessons. What they experienced in the natural, he's trying to speak to us in the supernatural. He's trying to give us warning. He's trying to get us to take heed. Verse 6 of this same chapter said, Then an Israelite man brought into the camp a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Think about this. God had sent a plague into the midst of Israel because of their sins, because of their committing harlotry and adultery with these Midianite women and these women of Moab. He had sent his judgment in. 24,000 people had died because of the plague. And everybody knew it, and yet here is a man, a son of a priest yet, who goes and takes one of these foreign women... He takes this foreign woman and right in the front of Moses and everybody that's right in front of the church, the tabernacle of God, he goes into a tent with the intent of laying with this woman. That's some bold sinning, amen? We had that community meeting here the other night and I didn't realize it when I offered to the people, they said, we want to have a community meeting. I said, well, they came out, they said, your church would be the perfect place to have that. And all I thought we were doing was helping the community, but I didn't know the community was going to show up nothing short of pitchforks and axes. I heard more cussing in this room Tuesday night than I have heard since I've been saved, and tomorrow will be 39 years since I became a Christian. I heard SOB this and SOB that, and they forgot where they were. <laughs> Good thing there wasn't a Phineas around. <laughs> Verse 7 says, when Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly. He took a spear in his hand, and he followed the, Israelites into, the Israelite into the tent. And he drove the spear into both of them, right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach. And then the plague against the Israelites was stopped. He was zealous for the Lord. It said, after the plague, the Lord said to Moses and Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, he said, take a census of the whole Israelite community by families, all those 20 years old or more who are able to serve in the army of Israel. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but I want to talk about this Phineas first. 
He was zealous for God. He was somebody that finally stood up and he said, look, 24,000 people have died and now this couple blatantly. And they were leaders. They were princes. She was a princess of the tribe of her people. They were leading God's people astray. And you say, why was God so upset here? Because they had committed sexual immorality. You know what sexual immorality does? Well, first of all, do you know what it is? We hardly do. We're inundated with sex everywhere in our society today, but we've lost sight of what, you know what adultery is, right? That's when you're married to somebody and then you go and have sex with somebody else. You know what fornication is, don't you? That's when you have sex with somebody you're not married to. These were the type of sins that they were committing. And you know, what God is showing us, He was showing us in the natural and in the physical, that if you do these things, spiritually for us today, what happens is you die inside. Your soul gets touched by it. It gets marred by it. Sexual immorality causes disease and sickness and more sin. It causes a society to go down in its moral compass and its moral standard. You know, one of the things that God said of Israel of old at one point through the prophet Jeremiah, he said, these people can't blush anymore. You know, and when I watch television and when I, you know, see magazines and things that are going on in our nation today, I say the same thing, man. We don't blush at nothing. Nothing is sacred anymore. Nothing is personal anymore. Nothing is private anymore. Everything is out in everybody's face. And we are seeing a society that is rotting from the inside out to the core. And then we ask ourselves, what is the problem? I can tell you what the problem is. (laughs) Sexual immorality and sin. Sin is a reproach to any people in any nation. I said all that to say this. If God ever says no to anything, it's because it'll kill you. You say, well, but I ate of the fruit of the tree and I didn't die. Yeah, you do. You die little by little, and you die by degrees, and you die inside. Your body may stay alive. Your mind may stay somewhat alert, at least for a while, but inwardly you die. And worst of all, you die from your relationship to God. Sin's not a puppy dog. Sin's not a mistake you make once in a while. Sin is a choice that is deadly. The wages of sin is death. Say, Pastor Ken, I wish you'd talk about something else. I wish you'd make us feel good all the time when we leave church. I don't want you to feel good. I want you to live. <laughs> Actually, I do want you to feel good. I want you to get filled with the Holy Ghost where you'll have, be full of joy and the glory of the Lord and have the peace of God and have the life that God died on the cross to give you. That's what I want you to have. So I'm not going to lie to you and cushion you while you disobey God and die on the inside. I go back to the New Testament, Pastor Ken. See, the reality is God is showing us in all these instances where His judgment has come, He showed us His judgment outwardly on the nation of Israel to teach us what would happen to us inwardly and spiritually if we do the same things. Don't take my word for it. Read your Bible. In Numbers 26, I want to read it to you again. After the plague, after the plague was over, after the plague was stopped, it said, the Lord said to Moses and Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, take a census of the whole Israelite community by families. All those 20 years old or more who are able to serve in the army of Israel. I just got through my introduction. Now I'm at the message. I want to talk to you today about divine numbering. Divine numbering. Take a census, God says, and start numbering Israel. How many of you know we've had that instruction before? In the beginning of this book, when we first started this book, the first thing God said, I want you to do is I want you to take a head count. I want you to take a head count of everybody. I've had foolish people all the years I've been a pastor. You know, I talk about winning the loss and filling up the church and filling up the house of God. I got cussed for saying that the other night. I did. I started the meeting with this welcome. I said, you know, It's good to have all the community out this evening, and and if you don't have a home church, I'm the pastor here. This is New Life Christian Ministries. I said, we'd like to invite you to attend one of our services. They're at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. We have Bible studies through the week, and then I turned it over. 
to the rest of the meeting. When the meeting was over, a lady stood back there. She walked up to me. She said, you're disgusting. I said, what, what ma'am? She said, you're disgusting. She says, I can't believe you're using this to build your congregation in your church. I said, well, ma'am, wait a minute. I said, all we're doing is hosting a meeting. I said, but that's not really what I'm doing. I said, we're about getting people saved and getting them to heaven. She said, I don't care. You're disgusting. I said, we're about getting them to heaven. That's what I'm trying to do. And all I did was give an invitation to church. She said, I'm dis she said you're disgusting. She said, my husband and I pulled up on the lot and saw this beautiful property, came in and saw this beautiful church. She said, we thought we might visit here. She said, but I'll never come to your church. Told me that, standing right back there, right in my face. And I'm using better language than she did. <laughs> the world's in bad shape, I'm telling you. It's in bad shape. It's in bad shape. But down through the years, people have said this to me. They said, God ain't worried about numbers. Pastor Ken, why do you keep talking? You know, I had the deacons ask me one time. They said, Pastor Ken, if you get a church of 100, are you going to be satisfied? I said, well, I said, what do you think? They said, no. They said, what about 300? I didn't even have to say anything. They said, no. They said, 500. I said, no. I said, as long as we can reach one more person. I'll never be satisfied as long as there's breath in my lungs. I'm going to try to reach one more person. I want to fill up the house of God. But you know what a lot of people said to me down through the year? They said, God ain't worried about numbers. I got news for you. He wrote a book called Numbers. Oh, God is really worried about numbers. He is really worried about numbers. Not for numbers' sake, but for soul's sake. He numbers the stars. Do you know that? He said, I have named them all. I put them in place. Actually, I think he let Adam name some of them, or all of them. But he said, I put them in place, and I know the number of them. He said, Abraham, he said, I know how many is out there, and you're going to have more descendants than you can number in the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, buddy. And you know what? God knew exactly how many grains was on that seashore. I love this. God said, for those who love him and do the work of his kingdom as they go through this world, he says, one day they're going to be mine, and in that day I'm going to make up my jewels of them. Of those that serve God, those that love God, those that work to help to build the kingdom. And by the way, thank every one of you that helped to put that women's conference on yesterday. There was an army of people that worked behind the scenes. Amen. I love it. As a pastor, man, I look and I say, we're on the move. We are marching on. We are doing the will of God in the earth, man. I have waited for years to see what I'm starting to see in New Life Christian Ministries. I'm starting to see this army rise up on its own without me having to push it all the time and get the work of God done in the earth. And guess what? You're going to be numbered in God's jewels. God says the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now, he didn't say, I know you got a bunch or you only got a little. It's almost as if every single hair is numbered, and he knows exactly what the number is. You say, I left part of them in the hairbrush. Yeah, but he knows. He knows which one. He knows the number of them. Now, God told these men to take this census, and how many of you know God could have counted them all in the blink of an eye himself? One of the things you're going to see as you go through the Old Testament is you, if you dig a little bit, you're going to find out why God doesn't just jump in and fix everything for everybody all the time. And church, I got news for you. God loves you. God cares about you. The hairs of your head are numbered. He said, your names are written on the palms of my hands. And he cares about you. But you know what? Going through this life isn't about him being a Santa Claus and a sugar daddy and just fixing everything for you. It's about changing you, transforming you, molding you, making you a mature disciple and follower of Christ so that you can become a part of God's army in the earth and do the will of God. Say amen or oh me. <laughs> God has a bigger plan than just fixing everything for you. He could fix everything for all of us in a split second. And I know when you're hurting, I know when your loved ones are dying or you're dying or feel like you can't go another step, you wonder, God, where are you and why aren't you doing something different than what you're doing? But you got to trust him when you can't see his hand, trust his heart. He's working something greater, but there's nothing that he misses. God is always numbering. He made number to find out who is present, but how many of you know that in doing that, he also knows who is absent? 
You know, you don't have to come here very long to find out I'm big on the Lord's Day and being in church. You know what I think about every Sunday morning? I think almost every Sunday morning at some point this crosses my mind. I think, what if the rapture happened today in this service? Wouldn't you want to be found here? Wouldn't you want to be found doing this? Wouldn't you want to be found right here as we explode through the roof? Amen. Amen. See, God always knows who is here and who's present, but he also knows who's missing all the time. You may fool your pastor. You may fool your friends. But you won't fool God. He knows. He knows the total number, but you know what? It's not enough for him to know the totality of everybody. He wants to know whether David's place is empty at the table. He wants to know whether the younger son has gone from the father's house. He wants to know when one piece of silver out of ten is lost or whether one sheep out of a hundred has gone astray. He counts it all. He sees it all. He counts it all. We are all of consequence to the Father because God does not look at us through the glory of His majesty but through the oneness of His fatherhood and of His love for us. I know some of you, when you go stand by the ocean side at the beach and you look out across that ocean or you look up into that starry sky, maybe you feel closer to God. I don't. I got to tell you, I'm just being honest with you. I love the ocean, I love nature, love the beach, and all of those things. But you know, when I stand at night and I look out in the stars, or I see those Hubble telescope pictures, and I see those galaxies, I think, what is man that you would be mindful of us in the midst of all that? I mean, God, really, this little speck, this minutia, this piece of dust on this blue ball in this giant universe do you really know that I'm here but he does <laughs> I didn't say I didn't feel close to God I just said that don't make me feel close to God why because I see his majesty I see his handiwork I see the glory I, I still can't even fathom I know it's true because I've seen it but I still can't even fathom how the, the world is round you're not really sitting down, you're sitting out. You're not standing up, you're standing out. And I've driven across vast plains and deserts and mountains and I still can't figure out how that is, but I can see that it is. <laughs> it's the miracle of God and the majesty of God. But you know, in our lives every day, we need to know that God can see us. I mean, it's great that he created the universe and holds the whole earth in his hand, but there are times when I need to know that he just cares about little old me right here in my speck and spot and dirt and dust. <laughs> and he does. It's hard to fathom how he can, but he does. Why? Because he's got a father heart. You know what he said about you and I as his children? He said, you better take heed that you don't despise one of these little ones. It'd be better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and you'd be thrown into the depths of the sea that you should offend, wound the heart of one of these little ones that called by my name. Glory to God. <laughs> the God of the universe is your defender. He is. He is your fortress. He is your strong tower. He is your shield in front of you and your great reward and shield and protector behind you. And he cares about you. And he cares about me. The God of the universe can come down to every one of us individually. So everywhere we find God concerning himself with individuals, with single families, but thank God with solitary lives. We've got to have that in life, don't we? Don't we? I've had a few people come up to me down through the years. They say, God, or they say, yeah, God. They say, Pastor Kenny, they say, I believe in God. But right now I need some Jesus with some bones and some flesh on. Can you care about me? Can you love me? Can you be concerned about me? Can you maybe help meet some need in my life? <laughs> There's times we all need a Jesus with flesh on, don't we? 
God, I know you love me, I know you care, but I need somebody that can reach out and physically touch me right now. God can do that too if we let him, if we walk close enough with him that we have eyes that we can see him. He can do that too. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, but we still need each other. He's created us that way. But I want you to behold both the goodness and the severity of God. It says that in the book of Romans, and it says to those that love God and obey Him, God's goodness and mercy and grace is there. Those that disobey Him, those that mock Him, you better watch out. More than 24,000 people lost their lives in this situation. The chapter that we're reading, excuse me, reads very much like the first chapters of this book in Numbers. It's the same names of the tribes of Israel as they number them and name them. And if you read them together, it would seem like you're reading the same thing. In fact, a lot of us don't read a lot of those chapters. We skip over them because we think, man, that's the same thing I read back here and it looks the same. Oh, but it's not. Oh, but it's not. We so roughly read the Bible that we imagine every chapter is like every other chapter because we don't number after God's critical number and God's critical method. And if we're not careful, we'll miss all the finer details. People like to kid me around here. If we start studying a book of the Bible in one of our Bible studies, one thing's for certain, I preach an eternal gospel. It'll take months. The big joke after most of the Bible studies I teach is, well, we made it through three verses. We made it through. You know why that is? Because this book is so pregnant with truth. <laughs> People say to me, good preaching, Pastor Ken, and I think this thing will preach itself. It'll preach itself if you preach the truth that's in it. And there is so much in every part of it. If we will look and we will lay it before God and we'll take that seed offering of the Word and we'll lay it before the throne of God and say, now God, I know this is written words on a page, but this is the living Word of God that's able to transform me, change me, and save my soul. And God, I need you to open that thing up and turn the light on and do some heart surgery in my life through it. And I found out you've got to pay attention to detail if you're going to do that. If we're not careful, we're going to miss all the finer details. Man, don't you just skim and hop and jump. Don't you worry about it. You need to read this thing all the time. But make sure when you're reading it that you're not only reading it, but God is speaking to you. And if you're reading a lot of it and he isn't speaking to you, you need to slow down, back up, and look in a little bit deeper. Because this is the word of Almighty God. These chapters are not the same. The historic names are the same, but man, what a going down in detail and what a difference there is in what's going on in these people's lives. There's two great truths revealed in this 26th chapter. The first is this, that God sees all of us and he does give attention to detail. Yeah, he does. See the wise, the fool, the rich, the poor, the faithful, and the faithless, the good and the bad, they're not all the same no matter what general name they fall under. See, we can call ourselves the church, but God sees us deeper than that, finer than that, more detailed than that. Somebody can say to you, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian, but God sees deeper than that. He sees the detail of that. You know, we can say to the world, America is a Christian nation. And it is. Our national religion is Christianity. We had a president that was trying to make it something else, but he failed, <laughs> at least for a while. It's time for us to stand up and be who we're supposed to be in Christ. It really is. God's given us some mercy and a time and a space, but it's time to stand up and be up for God. Amen? And we can call ourselves a Christian nation, but God's looking at the detail. He sees it all. Now, here's another truth you need to learn from this. The second is this. The sin of the individual does not destroy the election of an entire race. Thank God for that. You know why America still exists today? Because of you. You who name the name of Christ, and Paul said, if you name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. 
Those of you that not only call yourselves Christians, but you live as Christians, Jesus said you are the light and the salt of the earth. He said without you, it would be worth nothing. And I assure you, without the Christianity, the real Christianity that lives in this country today, God would have already shut the doors of this nation down for its sins and its provocation against heaven. We got sinners calling out our sins from other nations. We've got other nations saying, we need to send some missionaries to you guys to bring you back to Christ. And that's true of much of the Christianity in our country today. But here's the reality. Thank God, God doesn't destroy us all. Israel's still here, even though thousands have sinned against God and gone to their doom. Don't imagine that it lies within the power of any man to stop the purpose or arrest the kingdom of God. I know some of us, we've been worried. We were worried for years. We're still worried what's going to happen to our country. And even more than that, what's going to happen to Christianity? I can tell you what's going to happen to Christianity. Nothing. Nothing. Christianity will be here when every despot, lying, sinful, ungodly person has breathed their last breath. Jesus Christ will still be here. His church will still be here. (laughs) You don't stop the kingdom of God. You're either going to fall on this stone... (laughs) and be broken, or this stone's going to fall on you and grind you to powder. I'm serious. See, Balaam couldn't curse Israel, but Israel could curse themselves. No man, and you need to hear this. I wish my first pastor, I hope he knows it now, but I wish he'd have known it years ago. My first pastor thought people could stop the will of God in his life and for the church. Yeah. Yeah. And he would get upset and he would carry these great burdens. And when he wanted to do something in God and it didn't happen, he blamed some person. And for a while, I thought the same thing because he was leading me. And I thought, he knows more than I know. And then I started reading the Bible. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. It'll even get you past preachers when they don't know what they're talking about. Amen. And I started reading the Bible and I realized you can't stop God from doing nothing. You absolutely can't. In fact, I wouldn't get in his way if I was you because he will go right over top of you, round you, under you, something. But you need to know this truth for your own personal life. Nobody, nobody can permanently hurt you if you're a child of God. Nobody can permanently hurt you except you and the ones that you let. Nobody. You know why? Because God is your defender. God is your fortress. God's promises are yes and amen. They will stand and prevail when heaven and earth passes away. And as long as you walk in God, there is nothing that can come against you except yourself. Balaam finally figured out there was no way to curse Israel, but if he could get get Israel to sin against God, they'd curse themselves. And that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. See, what the highest prophet could not do externally, the meanest tempter, can do inwardly to us and spiritually. Balaam brought Israel into entanglement with the Midianitish women, and in one day, 24,000 Israelites fell. Suicides! They brought it on themselves. They knew better. They had been taught. They understood the Word of God, and they knew that they would lose out with God, and they did it. A lot like church people come to church and listen to the preacher and go out and sin like the devil. You better stop it. You better stop it. They weren't blasted by an external curse of priest or prophet or magic conjurer, but they were lapsed in their heart. They devoted themselves to things forbidden. They were self-damned. Balaam didn't have to damn them. Even God himself didn't have to damn them. They were self-damned. Every example in the Old Testament where God sends judgment, what he's trying to teach you is sin of its own self will destroy you. It will do to you inwardly, spiritually, what you see and what you think God does to them outwardly. What a wonder if God would have these people remember. Not only that he might take account of life and who was left, but you know, in counting who was left, he also had a registry of who was lost. How many of you know it's good to number the dead? Find out what diseases they died of and to 
have our attention sometime directed toward the cemetery instead of the hustling, bustling lives that we live all the time. I went to a funeral of a great man of God this past week. Pastor Bill and I went there because he was our worship leader many years ago and was a worship leader in the church for some 50 years. He's buried in a cemetery that used to be behind the house that I lived in, and I used to go out there a couple nights a week and just lay in the grass in the summertime in the cemetery and pray. You want to get serious with God? You want to get serious about life? You want to get serious about prayer? Go lay on your belly in the dirt in front of somebody's tombstone that you don't know and look across the cemetery and start praying. I guarantee you it'll open your eyes to what is real and what really is life. See, God wants us. He wants us to be reminded. He turns those cemeteries into flower gardens. <laughs> There's a message in that I don't have time for. But, but, you know, we need to realize we're not going to be here forever. Our dear brother that we laid in the grave this past week, he knew he wasn't going to be here forever. They had a video of him leading worship and singing at his funeral. Man, that's the way I want to go out. Glory to God. Love God, serve God. All of his life was singing in his last day of his life. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. Glory to God. How'd you like to sing that on your way out? <laughs> there will be peace in the valley. Oh, Lord, I pray. That's the way you want to go out. You need to realize that while you're living We've got to ask ourselves another question. 24,000 people have sinned against God and died, so how does the kingdom of God stand now? i got news for you. It's still standing. It is still standing. It's still standing. You can be a part of a kingdom that stands forever if you live for God. It's foolish to think that even if 24,000 Israelites all caught in sin and smitten with a common plague at one time would die, that it would stop the advancement of the kingdom of God in the earth. You know, there have been some great men of God in my lifetime, in my Christian lifetime, that have fallen and they have brought great disgrace, some of them nationwide, to the church. I'll never forget I'd only been a pastor maybe for a year, if that long, maybe two years. And some of, some of the greatest men of God, televangelists, started to fall. I used to love Jimmy Swaggart. I had sat in his church. I had seen ministers changed and their lives changed. I had watched 80,000 people down in Brazil run in his camp meetings and stuff and run to give their hearts to Christ. He was a mighty man of God. But he fell into gross sin and he didn't do it just once he did it again oh some of you are too young to even have seen him in the days when he was in his prime and in his ministry I ran across channel surfing here a couple years ago on a Sunday evening he's still on TV he used to be all over the world he used to you couldn't turn a television on on Sunday without seeing him preaching to thousands and thousands of people and people being filled with the Holy Ghost and being saved I saw him on television here a few years back. I just accidentally come across him, and, and I watched him, and he's still preaching the gospel. God is merciful. God is forgiving. He's got his life right. But I looked at my wife. I said, this must be what Samson looked like after they punched his eyes out. And I think, oh, my, the opportunity that you squandered. And it wasn't long. One of the other big-name preachers, you know, they fell. And, and my mom, who's here today, she came to me one day. She said, Kenny, how you like being a preacher? Or, you know, I'd only been a preacher for a year or two. I said, Mom, I said, I'm kind of bummed. I said, for the first time in my life, I've got a really respectable job, and now it's not respectable. I said, you tell people they're a preacher, and they look at you like, yeah, you must be a whoremonger and a womanizer. And a... There were some people that followed Jimmy Swaggart that when he fell, they fell out of church. They fell out of the kingdom. They quit following God. They said, man, this is the end. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. I asked God one time, I said, God, why did you let him get caught? Why did you get, let him get found out? He said, because I love him. My son died for him. He needed to get out of his sin too. 
I don't care about his ministry. I can build a million ministries. I can raise up of these rocks, children unto Abraham. You're not going to stop God just because people mess up. Oh, that, that ought to just cheer your heart. <laughs> Be a part of God's kingdom. Be a part of it. The kingdom of God is decreed to be an everlasting kingdom. Read the book of Daniel. The covenant's been made. God said heaven and earth will pass away before God will break his covenant with his people. Nothing can hinder the kingdom of God in your life or in mine or in the world. You better get on God's side. He is the winner. You can read the end of the book or you can watch him right now. He wins every time in every situation and circumstance. You say, oh, there's a lot of evil people rising out there. They got a lot of evil stuff going on in the media. They're going to come and go. They're going to come and go, and God will still be here. You need to be on his side. I got to get done. See, we bewilder ourselves sometimes by looking at the individual sinner or individual saints or believers and saying, how can the kingdom of God make any progress if prominent Christians are faulty in character and spirit? See, we're talking... In like fools when we talk like that. I know what a lot of the law says. Man, there's hypocrites in the church. There is. <laughs> I remember sitting on a church pew as a lay person on a Sunday night in a church packed with about this many people. It wasn't true, but this is where my heart was at. I said, God, they're all hypocrites. Everybody I'm looking at is a hypocrite. And I knew most of them were because I had seen them outside the church. I'd been in some interaction with them, I said, they're all hypocrites. I looked over and thank God I seen one little lady. He said, she's not. Oh uh, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> you know what God spoke to my heart that night? Changed my life. He said, you're right. He said, most of them are. He said, but do you want to be a part of the problem or part of the answer? He said, I need somebody to live for me and to show others how to live for me. He said, quit looking at them. <laughs> quit looking at them and look at me. Will you be one of my jewels on the day that I make up my ground? I'm serious. I am serious as a heart attack, twice as deadly. He spoke to my heart. He said, you're going to be a part of the problem, you're going to be a part of the answer. I said, God, I want to be a part of the answer. I want to be a part of the answer. God will always have a people. I'm friends with an evangelist. He travels all over the world. I believe he's in India or somewhere this morning. And man, he, he loves God with a passion. But he got on there the other day and he said, man, he said, you Christians in America, you got to straighten up. He says, isn't there anybody preaching the gospel? I wrote him back. I said, brother, there's at least 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You ain't the only one preaching the gospel, brother. There are a lot of people that love Jesus in this land. There's a lot of people that are sold out to God completely and totally, thank God. Why? Because God will always have a kingdom. And the kingdom of heaven is an everlasting kingdom. It moves through the city. It moves through the cemetery. It goes up steep hills. It goes down dark valleys. You can't stop the progress of the kingdom of God. Now, you need to understand, evil men will come and go, and the Bible said the closer we get to the end, the more of them there will be. It said evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, and there's going to be more of them. But don't let that detract you from living for Christ. Because there are people out there that are still looking for the God that you found. They're still looking for the hope. They're still looking for the peace. They're still looking for the cleansing that God can bring to their lives. Glory to God. Jesus said nation would rise against nation, kingdom against pe kingdom, and people will rise up against God. And the day's going to come when they think those that kill you as a Christian are going to think they're doing God's service. I, I wanted to go hide somewhere the other night. I thought I was going to be taken out before they all got out of here. I got with that group of people who came here to make a presentation. I said, you all stay right here. Let's wait till this parking lot empties out. I mean, there were people threatening their lives. And I understand their heart. I understand their reasoning. But man, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. That is not how to live life. But you know what? It doesn't matter how evil the world gets. God says, I'm going to have them all in derision. You know what that means? I'm going to laugh at them. I'm going to laugh at them. I'm going to ask the worship team to come to the platform. But as they're coming, I want to read to you Psalm 2. 
And I want you to hear Jesus that loves you, the one that's numbered the hairs on your head and has his name, your name written in the palm of his hand. I've often wondered, I thought, how does he have all of our names written on his hand? But somebody told me in a country song years ago, you know the only man-made thing in heaven is going to be the scars in his hands. And those scars are you. Those scars are... He died for you. They're your sins, your name. They're everything about you is written in his hand. But listen. Listen to the God that loves you. He's telling you about your future. He said, why do the nations conspire and peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. You know, if you're a part of the church today, I'm not talking about part of the religious people that go into a building and sing songs about God every Sunday. I'm talking about people that have repented of their sins, that are looking in the Word of God, that with all that they are and all that they can and every part of their being and with the anointing of the Holy Spirit are seeking to live for God and please God with every breath and every step that they take. If you're a part of that church, you're going to be hated by the world, I can tell you. It says, let us break off their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Some of you are too young to remember this, but there was a movie years ago. There was an atheist woman by the name of Shirley MacLaine. In this movie, she was standing out on the beach in front of the ocean, yelling atheist obscenities at God. What do you think a joke that was from heaven's view? The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger. He terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I've installed my king in Zion on my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today have I become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You'll dash them to pieces like pottery. If you read the end of the book, you'll find that Jesus is coming back on a white horse. You, you say, you believe that, Pastor Ken? You better believe I believe it. That's going to be the most beautiful, majestic white horse you've ever seen in your life. And it's going to have bells on it, reins. It says, holiness, holiness, holiness to the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. He said, you'll break them with a rod of iron. You'll dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, your kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. And your way lead to destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. <laughs> you can go ahead and worry about the end of the world. You can worry about the apocalypse and Armageddon. I live in the kingdom of God. It is not going down. It is not going down. When heaven and earth is removed, it's not going down. I serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I serve the Prince of Peace. He is the only one that will ever bring peace to this planet. And he's coming one day to do it. And I want to be waiting on him when he comes. Or caught up in the air to meet him in the, uh, meet him in the air. Glory to God. Don't you? Now that choice is yours. God rules the nations and kingdoms of men. His plan, his purpose, his kingdom are eternal and forever. He sees the very hairs of your head, but he also sees every action. He sees every deed. He sees every motive of the heart, and he is numbering it all in great detail. Nothing, nothing gets away from his sight. I know some of you have been through tragic, terrible things in your life and you still haven't found justice in the courts of law or in this life. You see things happening around you, you see bad things happening to good people and you say it's not just and it's not fair and it isn't and this world will never be. But I'm telling you there's coming a day and a time when the God of all glory and grace is going to set it all right. Don't you give up your faith. Don't you give up your walk with God. Man, this thing ain't over yet. You hear me? But we're the ones that have to decide every moment, in every detail, in every temptation, in every trial, whether we're going to be registered in the list of the dead or of the living. Amen? Are we a part of God's kingdom? Really? Not just in name, not just in pretense, 
but in spirit and in truth. Or are we a part of the kingdom of this world that is going to fall one of these days? I'm going to close with this, and I am closing. Revelation 20, verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Do you know what those books are? Numbered detail and account of every idle word, of every idle deed, of every idle motive that any human being has ever experienced or been a part of. It said, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. You say, does it matter how I live for God since Jesus' grace and blood has covered me? Yes, it does. It doesn't save you. You don't get there by being good yourself. But if you are saved, you are created to do good works in Christ Jesus. You were created to forsake your sin and follow Jesus Christ and walk even as he walked in his earth. Then death and Hades were thrown into the... Each person was judged according to what they had done, and then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written, numbered, in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Pastor Ken... How can I make sure things are right with God? This is what you have to do. You have to come to the place in your life, first of all, where you say, God, I realize in not living for you, I am sinning against you. And God, I have sinned against you. The Bible says all have sinned against God. All. It doesn't matter. Your grandmother sinned against God. Oh, grandma, nanny, yeah. Grandma did. Many, many times. But you've got to come to the place in your life where you say, God, I'm done sinning. And by your grace, if you will forgive me and put your Holy Spirit inside of me and empower me, I'm now going to start walking with you, God. And I'm going to trust you to change me. I'm going to start doing your will instead of my will. And God, I ask your forgiveness. And the moment you do that, you become washed and cleansed because of what Jesus did for you on that cross 2,000 years ago. In just a moment, we're going to turn the lights down. I'm going to ask all of you to stand. We're going to worship. But there are pastors and prayer warriors here. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're not a part of His kingdom. You're still a part of this world. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to come. All you'll have to do is come and stand. We're not going to call you out or anything. We're just going to pray with you. So you can pray that prayer. But when you pray that prayer, what you're doing is committing your life to follow God from that day forward. And I got some really good news for you. Tomorrow at about 7.35, I will have been saved for 39 years. <laughs> I celebrate it every year. I was 22 years old, and I've almost lived 40 years for God. Thank God. But I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter what your addiction is, what your habit is, what your sin is, what situation or circumstance that you're in. I was not the same person that day as you see me standing here today. But I can tell you this, Jesus can set you free. Jesus can heal you. Mind, soul, body, spirit, habits, life. And you haven't began to live until you let Jesus Christ into your heart and life and begin to live for him. Amen? Amen. So if you need Jesus, and if you don't have him, you desperately need him, I want you to come as we worship. Would you stay in church? I want you to worship. If you're a Christian, I want you to worship. I want you to pray. If you're not a Christian, I want you to come and stand at this altar. Let's bow our, bow our heads in prayer. Father, we love you and we praise you and we glorify your name, Lord God. You're an awesome God. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the mighty Jehovah, the everlasting Prince of Peace. Father, we thank you for your word that was spoken here today, Lord. Father, we thank you for the times of refreshing and the times of being healed, being filled with your spirit today. You're an awesome God. We love you and we praise you and we glorify your name. Father, now speak over your people. Father, make them the head and not the tail. Bless them as they come in and bless them as they go out. 
prosper them in all that they do, Lord God. Let there be great signs, wonders, and miracles follow them all the days of their life. I speak divine health over every person in this room, Lord God. And Father, we pray for divine appointments this week. Father, we know that some of our loved ones and our friends need to come unto you, Lord. They need to receive your salvation. I pray that you draw them unto your salvation this week. And Father, whatever need that may be, may be needed from these people, Lord, that you would touch them this week and meet them in a special way. Father, we give you all the praise and the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless.